the larger perimeter of responsibility, the more information, we're back to education, what do you need to know, what do you want to do? Do you, you want to go to seminary? What do you want to do? You want to be a brain surgeon, space scientist, or you want to run a camp? See, those are different things. So you have to find out what you want to do, then we can talk about how to prepare for some of that. Okay. So if everybody wants to be a custodial chaplain, then you just hope the church die and just uh, get a new set of keys so at least two of you have a set of keys to lock it up so you can go home. No. But see, the church can't have too many custodial chaplains in the pulpit. We got too many, and we will. Golly. Well, I, I, I'd say more than that. Bill's a very bright, precious man, and he knows because he's too intelligent not to know, but probably 90% are custodial chaplains. Now, Psalm 19, the heavens are telling, now this is anthropomorphic. I don't believe that the stars sing. I'm not a Mormon. I believe it's inspired also, but I don't believe it's literally the case. The heavens are telling, the, the form, participial form, of the glory, what are, what are they telling? That God is love? That God is incarnate? No, they tell of his glory. Well, what is that? Same thing in Romans. When people today were in a pluralistic age, they suppress the truth, hold it down. Well, why would anybody hold down the truth if there isn't any truth? We're in a relativistic, pluralistic age. See, that is that self-referential fallacy in logical theory. It destroys itself. Self-destructive. Everybody's got a little piece of the truth, and Christianity just has its chunk. So what we've got to do is get all the truth and, and syncretistically put those together, and then we'll have a world global vision. What's that like a hawk? It'd be like nine AIDS patients coming together to help each other to get well. That is not possible. So, God, see notice the first thing is in verse 18 in Romans, because it's important, because it's the whole theology that runs through the Bible. Paul says that God is progressively ingressing, judging, see, condemning the world. Well, that's not the day of judgment because of the verb form. He's presently judging the structures of the world. And what are you judging them for? And two things. One is that their relationship with God is broken, and the other is their relationship with man is broken. In the vocabulary, see, they're ungodly. Those two words that don't mean very much to most people. But they're, they're ungodly. And what? In Romans 1, since you're, you're the paper writer jumper there. Reprobates. Hmm? Well, that's certainly true. You know, you see, you know the two words. One is about relationship with God. One is relationship with man. So a relational crisis. We need a relational revolution. Well, there being group growth. Those the programs you want. In 13, in chapter 13, he, he says he uses governments as part of that grand. Well, see, that's part of the structure. Even a bad government is better than total chaos. See, even a bad government is better than total chaos in the Philippines. Even a bad government is better than total chaos in Nigeria, or Liberia, or any place. I don't mean that that's good, but that's better than nothing like everybody did about the right in his own eyes. Because there is some possibility of holding some restraint, even in evil. Now, that's not overly optimistic form, but a bad government in the Bible between totalitarianism and, see, complete control and uh, anarchy. So you can't have human existence in total anarchy or total totalitarianism. The Bible is not uh, from a godless playing, praying Republican, you know, bouncing a basketball around the Indianapolis 500, hunting mushrooms and going to Brown County to watch the leaves turn. That's not God that's in the Bible. So, look here. Truth, God, suppressing, and then worship. And see, they worship the wrong thing. And then in Romans, because it's just like in the Psalm 24, 26, 28, all the social consequences, personal and social consequences. Family disruption, personal disruption, family. And you all got to this presence or his glory. See, when he removes that, nothing leaves man to the consequences of his decision. And ultimately, man's free to make some decisions. 
but not predetermined consequences. I mean, but ultimately, you will see where, because what like Schaefer tried to say, you know, the, the, our Christian worldview gives us, gives us the ability to have freedom without chaos, but, but then when we lose that perspective, it forces us into a totalitarian state because we can't, we won't control ourselves, we've got to have somebody. Now, I find Schaefer isn't even read anymore, and that's as thin as it ought to be. No. See, anything thinner than that, just send me blank pages, and I'll put something on. But they aren't reading, even at that level. We've lost any advancement about these things in the 70s. Every generation just can't go through them again. See, we need to advance, because things in the 90s are tougher than the 70s. So, you see, the truth, it's odd. God's judgment, God's judgment, and where's the judgment show up? It shows it up in human relationships. And that gets very practical, doesn't it? This is rather abstract for most people. You say, oh, what practical? Tell me something that I can use. Well, your whole worldview will show up down here. And it turns from God and truth to self. Meeting my needs. Gratification and selfishness. It's always, that always happens. You need to get outside and get the dignity of who we are in the context of worshiping God. Or inside, and uh, I'll only come to your church to meet my needs. What? That's an egocentric crisis. Barna, in that marketing church, he said that the church should think of itself as an as a organization that needs people who should. Well, what I got to, the odd thing is that there's people in and out of our brotherhood that buys that book, line and sinker. Yeah. It'd be like taking narcotics because it's cure. It's death. Well, heavens are telling the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day, force for speech, night to night. Now notice, there's no brokenness in creation's praise of the glory of God. Their voice is, there is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, global, because the God of creation is the only place outside of human concern that can get global perspective about it. And their utterance to the end of the world, those are two different Hebrew words, but it's talking about larger than Israel. The covenant people with the hymn book are not just talking about a God who is a God over Israel. Now in them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It's rhetorical. It rejoices as a strong man to run in his course. It's rising as one into the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now notice God control, just providence. Now the first thing we lose when we come to the science, scientific revolution, is in the name of physics and astronomy, we lose this. Then we lose and reinterpret God, the creator. Then by mid 19th century, we lose the biblical theology of providence. This is providence. See, creation and providence are inseparable. Because from the scientific revolution, and specifically from the arguments of human Kant at the popular level, we lose cosmic providence, and we have only internal design. Theology of providence is not a major preoccupation, see, because we we'll want you to meet my needs now, and this general talk is not too helpful. But see, the theology of providence stands or falls on the biblical theology of creation. So yeah, this is just a symbolic date, just as soon as Darwin publishes symbolically, that's the end of the biblical theology of providence in the Western world. And providence, to say, oh, the suffering, is this providential suffering? No, why am I suffering? There's no interpretation of the specific details in human life that have anything to do with the providence of God. Why does this happen to me? Now, even in Job, see, Job had a concept of providence because of the God that was given to But if you ask questions every day, why am I dying? Why does my medicine cost $800 a month? You know, why are these things happening to me? There's no larger picture to ask a different set of questions. Now, so symbolically, 
we lose this and this. We lose this in physics and astronomy, and we lose this in biology, in the biological revolution in the 19th century. It's no problem to trace that at all. So the Bible still has these doctrines, but see, the Bible is not where we lose the biblical model. So we can study the Bible and you get A in unpointed Hebrew and parsing Greek sentences and still couldn't address how do we get where we are in the 1990s? We cannot address that by merely studying the Bible again. So we don't want to not study the Bible, we have to study the Bible and everything else. So that creates the dilemma. But the 19th Psalm, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Is that true? It's easier to read than is that the case? The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the sin. Is that true? It's not complex. Sentence so The precepts, these are different Hebrew law, testimony, and precepts. These are different parameters of the Word of God. Right? Rejoicing the heart. Is that true? Have you been to church recently and it's prayer time and 47 people want you to pray for something that's happened in their lives? And you said, why don't we pray? Because I'm rejoicing today. You get any prayers over in Indianapolis or Cincinnati for that? It's always, it's a pathology list. What well, we've lost, we've lost the biblical perspective about prayer that's larger than my needs. See, Paul's intercessory theology, uh, theology of intercessory prayer. He was locked in jail. He never said, won't you pray for me? Get me out of here. This is bad for my health. I'm getting ready to retire. And I don't want to, to die here in, in this damp dungeon. He's praying for the church. And he's praying for people outside. Want to recover the theology of prayer? We, we say we're Bible people. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that we're Bible people. I we believe we talk about the Bible. And we own more Bibles than we read. But... Uh, or I just say we have different Bibles. That's what I'd have to say. Now notice rejoicing. Well, there's a lot of things going on in our lives that are not grounds for rejoicing. Well, what does this psalm have to do with creation? And what does creation have to do with worship? And what does having tragedies in your life and being in the assembly of the saints and saying, now, why don't we thank God for being sovereign over the world? My grandmother just died. My baby just died. I just lost my job. Two men at Jefferson Street, for all practical purpose, been working in places, responsible jobs, good men. 12, 13 years, lost their job. Now, it wasn't called firing. They just won't need them anymore. Well, when you go to church, and you say, well, why don't we rejoice? And said, well, I really, I, I don't have anything to rejoice about. And in Bobby Jean over there, next week, our divorce is final. So you go through all the human brokenness and you talk about creation and rejoicing and power, talk about hunger in Africa or any place. What do you rejoice about? Well, I don't rejoice in that. I rejoice in God because somehow there has to be a power to, to bring something to our lives. It's not all of this impossible material that we're asked to handle every day. And worship, see, true worship would be the source of dealing with the world. And not just the bullet, you know, step one, step two, step three. And we had a worship class, so we'll have variety of worship. That's always struck me as strange, but uh, you just mark that off for strangeness. But, you see, because that's psychology. Did the service agree with me? No, 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 no. Worship is, what do you think God thought about this? Well, he would even help people that are down in the mouth. Lose their job. See, I can't get them a job, so I, I'm not going to stand over and laugh at them, see, for being let go, or this family over here is getting a divorce. All, all the things you hear. Doesn't anything happen to anybody that's, that's for rejoicing? I guess not. Mark that out. I wonder if anybody in this room, anybody, anybody, now this is Psalm of David, you think of all the memories he had and he said everything I've done in my life I rejoice over it. Hmm? we've got to recover worship we've got to recover the lost thrill of worship I have a message on that but the last time the greatest preacher that I've ever heard whose native language is English is James S. Stewart and the last time he was in America giving stone lectures at Princeton that was the last time I heard him 
the press asked him, said, well, you've been all over the United States several years, uh, Dr. Stewart. He said, what would you have to say? You've been in large churches, you've been in small churches, you've been in the, in the Midwest, you've been in the great cities. What would you say? He said, without a moment's hesitation, I had lost the thrill of worship. I don't have any doubt about that. See, you have to entertain Americans. See, in the classier they are culturally, the more entertainment it's got to be, because it's got to be higher and higher entertainment, or I'm going someplace that's got it. But see, we've got to put God back in, and creation is the place to start. So creation is not just over a doctrine. It is a doctrine in the Bible, but it is a, it is a foundation of biblical theology. Well, the God of creation is the foundation. But it, you'll soon lose that God if you lose that, that affirmation about that God. So it comes to suffering in personal lives in Job. It comes to worship in the Psalms. It comes to view of history in Isaiah. It comes to a whole scheme of the purpose of the church in Romans, in Colossians, in Ephesians, and the book of Revelation. Why is the material about creation in the Bible? So you can have some strange class that's irrelevant for the churches? a great deal more than understanding Near Eastern Patternism or Greco-Roman cyclical view of eternal matter. See, no one had a view of creation in the whole world of the Bible, and the West has lost its view of creation. By and large. I don't mean no one believes it, but I mean as an influence. So read the rest of that just devotionally and say, now, if I believe in the God of creation, then is that the source of wonder and praise and marvel. Here are these marvelous, mar we'll read them. We, people read these things in the church. Nothing ever happens as a result of it. 13, 14, then we stop. Also keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. What does? Worship. Worshiping God, the God of, not worshiping creation. When that happens, see that, that's like Romans. That's something else. Every culture that Israel came in contact with, Babylonian, Egyptian, Canaanite, Medo-Persian, Greco-Roman, and then finally the West, and now the East, Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age, why is it ingressed? Because we've lost the categories that keep in abeyance. So we pay the price because people are only interested moment by moment in how it affects them, not seeing that most of the universe doesn't center around our individual lives. Does that be a surprise to most people? But the God who's created the world is also concerned about me, about you. But we're not the only people in the world. Hmm? That's hard to, for people to assimilate. Why, always, why does this happen to me? Now, when, how many of you read uh, the newspapers? You say, when war, or what's the news? And say, oh, isn't that a shame that all this is happening to other people? Is that how we talk? I mean, even we're more sensitive than some people. Read the newspapers, and say, oh, that's terrible. I'm sorry about that. But see, as soon as it hits us, well, see, you read the obituary and say, well, uh, Billy Smith's dad died. Well, that's a different thing than saying my dad just died. You know? See, we read those things when it's other people. It doesn't impact us. But as soon as we get here, we wonder why everybody in the world doesn't know about us. Is, it, is that true or false? Well, creation and God of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's an absolute affirmation. That's why you have to look at grammar. We love to look at it. And the theology, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, is not myth or saga. It is a confrontation with worldviews. And when Israel comes to Egypt, it's a confrontation with worldviews. And when Israel penetrates Canaan, it's a confrontation with worldviews. And when the church is within the Jewish context, that's less visible confrontation with worldviews. As soon as it's out in the Greek world, it's a worldview. Now, then the church spreads and it's out in the 17th and 18th century. We get a new worldview and we're just in the final turndown of the impact of high-tech megatrend in the 1990s. So, worship. See, you can't have a class on worship because that's a relationship. 
I don't mean you can't have a class on it. Huh? Of course you can. We've got one. And that might, might have some social relevance. Probably not, but it might. See, if I am so unconscious at home and I have to have a seminar, uh, I don't know that the seminars would be overly helpful. They may. Someone, I'm sure someone, somewhere, might possibly, it's possible in a finite universe, be helpful. But you mean I've got to be told from outside of me about this? Well, then you'll have to tell me everything. See, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to keep up with things. I'd have to go to seminars and be gone home, split the home up just going to seminars, self-help seminars. So if it weren't so tragic, it'd be a laughing matter. It's too tragic, see, to laugh very long at it. But when it comes, it's just like Romans, isn't it? You know what Romans said? Well, we either get right with God, and then we get right with one another, and we get right in the family, and we get right in the community, and get right in the church, so we can have a global vision, but if we spend all of our time, see, on infighting, see, it's like politicians infighting, talking about their cousins and everything. You can't, you can't have a global vision, see, because they have to lift up your eyes, and that removes focus of attention gloves and focus attention. I'm not opposed to those gloves or anything like that, but see, that's not a world. That's just a very tiny perimeter world. So think about it. Ask yourself, I ask myself, ask yourself, what is the place of creation in the hymn book of Israel? It's always for praise and glory of God. When people have trouble praising God, it might be that they don't know who he is. They've lost perspective on who he is, and therefore worship becomes the psychology of entertainment. And then you have to have a choir, and then you have to have an organ, and two back-to-back -back $80,000, 12-coat lacquered pianos, or you can't, you can't sing. Something's wrong with that. Uh, I have some specific details about what I think's wrong, but... You see, to, to sing, I've never heard any greater singing than uh, 550 kids in uh, Sire, Africa. No children, five, six, seven, eight years. And Grandma, she had this big stick, tennis shoes and no teeth. That child, this is two hours of singing. They get out of hand, she put that on the head, and they wouldn't get out of hand for another hour. And you met, that's un-American. You know, they'd, take it, they'd get a civil liberties lawyer if anything like that happened in, in America. Said, Our kids went to church to have fun. You're trying to control. But did these little children sing? I've never heard singing like that in my life. Now I've heard louder singing, but 500 little children singing for two hours. Now you've heard it. See? I have a confession. Uh, the girl, young man stood up there to sing, and the uh, music did not go on, and they were not singing. And I don't know how many times I have to take a trip up to Africa where we have no musical instrument to guide us in singing. And I they sing better than here. And I, said, well, I don't want to hear you more about it. <laughs> <laughs> is, is he, it's not the old hermeneutic that you're lost and going to hell. I can have a piano in the garage, but not in the church. But it's over worship. See? Uh, it, it's over. Uh, uh, just marvelous singing. See, I hate that. The best singing, I hate to have the best singing be the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing near my God to thee. They're polyphistic. Yeah, but they sing well. Uh, uh, well, they sing songs that people listen to. See, that's, a, that's the most widely listened to religious group, religious group in the world. But they're quite good. I, it's hard. I have to lie if I said they were bad. No, 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 no. I don't. I don't. I don't want that to see how again. But uh, think about creating. We're going to stop. Put these, pre and then I want you to talk to these brothers and who went out to have nourishment. And Dan, I got Dan, the uh, the school uh, uh, lessons officer. He's in jail. No, he's he's down in class. I want to get him out. 
but uh, we, we do know but we have to play some. And when we come again, now, uh, Dan, you, you're on next time, yeah. and uh, I want to start because he his paper is going to be on uh, creation and the scientific revolution. Uh, I want to uh, come to bear on the scientific revolution, just extending that for the next two weeks about the impact of, uh, of science and specifically the developments in 18th and 19th century science that is the historic origin of losing the concept of the absolute origin, finite mass in the universe. It has nothing to do with studying Hebrew. It has to do with science. So we're glad uh, uh, we've got a young man who's going to do a PhD in physics to, that you're going to help him uh, with this uh, uh, because he wants to testify see, that if you lose that category in a culture that's high-tech, scientific, you won't get it back just talking about the Bible. They already don't believe the Bible, see, generally like people. So I thank you and thank you for your reports. It's too much, one or two, maybe the first chapter is plenty. Uh, no more than the first and the eighth. You, you know, put in footnotes the other material, but don't even try to deal with all of Romans in, in brief papers. It'd only be frustrating to you, see. But no more than the first and the eighth chapter, and that's too much. That you'd have 20 pages of exegesis in chapters without saying. You just want me to deal then with how creation is using that one? Yes, you might have two or three page, two or three page introduction. Creation... Uh, and recreation are related in all these passages. Um, I don't know that you can't deal with them, but you would say for someone else who would read it, uh, I've chosen to limit in this brief discussion uh, this, this material here. But make it possible for a person who doesn't know that to say, hey, uh, I, I, I have it up here in two or three pages and then make the transition that you've decided to do that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. But Global Vision can't come to the Missionary Convention or any place. See, just by using the word global, can't. But most people cannot handle pressure. It, and it's primarily because the only thing they think about is themselves. And you psychologically cannot manage. They need immediate gratification resolution. And, see, that's not, that, that's just complete breakdown of any psychological integrity at all. So, uh, see, that's what happens when you lose that, when, when you have commitment about something, you don't constantly have a list of all the things you need and want right this minute. This guy. So it, it has direct consequences over not escaping this world in worldview, but what it is that worldview keeps certain things, see, from paralyzing. Yeah. And making us indecisive about day by day. See, this isn't the first world that's ever suffered or had any problems. See, that's what people think that you know nobody ever had any problems till I got here, and, yeah. and uh, that that is not true. The only thing that is true in the 90s and toward the 21st century is the size and complexity and and the pressure. You know, there isn't any question about that, but. Uh, if you can't handle, I think someone said, uh, if you can't handle uh, one, you can't handle ten. If you can't handle one problem, why well, give you ten problems to handle? Some, and uh, George Washington Carver said that uh, he had prayed God that he would give him uh, something large enough to uh, make a difference. And he said, God gave me the peanut, but he says, after all, some people can only manage peanuts. But see, he transformed an economy. <laughs> 300 something uses for it. Well, besides me liking peanut butter, see? But transformed an economy, what seemed to be a very small thing, but isn't small at all when you run the consequences out. See? So, uh, you know, every small thing doesn't have that, that large a consequence. So I'll, uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to see if Dennis is called. going to have to deal with the difference between evangelism, benevolence, mm -hmm. education. See, these aren't the same thing. That's how missions come in. Yeah. You see, when, when missions, you know, they're saying $100 a month to camp, $54 a month to 
to Africa, $23 a month to Bible college, and $150 a month to the nursing home. See, this benevolence, benevolence, benevolence is essential, but that's not mission. They just call anything that's going out. Now, now, and that'll have to stop, and I don't know how, how to stop it, you see, since I've said it for 25 years and no one pays any attention, but you have to try to try to redirect that in the churches. Well, that's one thing we've talked about. Hmm? We've talked about a few times that the fact that it's going to be the missionaries going out to educate the church. But you see, the ones in the past haven't done it. And I, I do not want to pursue it, but it's a matter of creation and God and purpose. Dr. Tom and Dr. Goldman are trying to help with that in their evangelism local church. One of the things you do is analyze your church budget to see what percentage hey, is really on the God, God that's a big one. <laughs> to see what percentage is really on the missions and what percentage is going to those. So we, say we give 10%. The issue is it leaves town and we don't get it. Hmm? And you, mean, you, you must carry this, carry this into the churches. I don't mean once. A talk on it will rectify it. It is a fundamental re-examination, or perhaps in many cases just an examination. You can't re-examine something you haven't examined. And it's, it's, fun, it's crucial so for any global perspective. Now there are churches, and, and then I'll be enough, there are churches that send more money, and you know we need nursing homes, well, send more money to camps and nursing homes than anything else. And that's all mission. What that is, is not a biblical model of mission, it is that the money leaves here. We don't spend it. And the educate, our, our heritage cannot really continue with more than five to eight schools. But how, how would you deal with that? How would you get people to say, hey, we don't when everybody knows it's the will of God that they be there sapping off the, uh, you know, and they can't cut the, the 20th century, nor the 21st. So new possibilities there. Um, talk talk about the mission thing in the churches to get them to say, hey, benevolence is one thing, uh, but don't don't say that's evangelism. That's not that's not the case. See, it's like preaching. There must be evangelistic preaching, but there's more preaching than evangelistic preaching. But have it ordered. You know, have it specific times when that's what's going on. So it always gets a visible uh, contact. See about the, but the whole biblical theology of stewardship is not grounded in American pragmatism. It's grounded in creation and stewardship. So it's not just trying to tack this on to, uh, to practical discussion consortium, but theologically, I'm not seeing that grappled with, see, the whole foundation of responsibility in the Bible is not just, well, we need some money for something. Okay? Uh, well, aren't your wife uh, doing okay? Yeah. Now, before we turn to the subject matter today, uh, I'm going to put worlds, cultures, basically speaking, there are five, five broad worldviews in the cultures of the world. Now, in the past, I'm going to put animism, now animism hasn't gone away. Now, this is the sacralization that the world's alive with spirits, cows and grass and animism. And we'll touch on animism in apologetics class. It's not just a mission project. It's a worldview matter. And past and animism and... Uh, in the West, I've got three things for the West, so we'll leave that alone. But the East, and I mean by East, Africa, Asia, I mean most of the people of the world. Most. Most cultural ethnic groups in the world. So I'm going to 
check that and put Islam. Now Lawrence is in a world where animism and Islam see are vying for people's uh, allegiance. And he brings an alternative into both of those. And it's not merely baptizing them, see, but it's trying to get them to see that it is a transforming commitment to Christ. It's not just a syncretist tack on. You know, here's some interesting new things that I heard one time. So we have Islam and creation. We have animism and creation. See, animism has no creation. At least in the Quran, Allah is the origin of the universe. But the universe, that sounds like certain forms of Calvinism. In Islam, every, every microsecond of reality is under the causal guidance of Allah. Now there's no way, no way, verbally or practically, to avoid this. Fatalism. There's, see how that works out in politics and world conflagration and fighting and the uh, tribes and nations and sections of the country. How can you have a worldview consciously commit to a worldview of fatalism and then worry about what other people are doing because you're committed to a fatalism, which is case around. Whatever happens, see, is, is caused by our law. Well, you can't live with that. No. Uh, and they don't. You can't and they don't. But I'm going to put, we'll, we'll talk about it in apologetics class this. This is an odd thing to be in that, but it has to be dealt with immediately, see, extensively in the, in the church. But a fatalism and God. See, it's not like they don't believe in God. They just deny that Jesus is God. So we have to confront the, the religions of the world primarily, but not totally over, over Jesus. Now, when they have a certain view of creation, that affects the openness, openness about incarnation. See, or we get avatars or gurus. See, see who, which Jesus? Yes, John. I just, when we've been talking to a couple of Mormons, mm -hmm. and, uh, the their, attitude, their attitude, you know, uh, uh, matter is eternal. I, I, didn't ever, I never realized that until we got into looking at some of that. that no way. God just a shape. No way. So God taught, but most people's view of God is the hazy, that just God makes them religious fanatics. So he just mentioned in the word God uh, that, well, these people are religious. What are you talking about? So <coughs> that's correct. They're polytheistic, pantheistic, and he's, uh, while they talk about the other testament of Jesus. Uh, <coughs> brother, friend of mine, uh, and a brother uh, in the last uh, I would call it Church of Christ. He, a uh, friend of his, he worked with Mormon. One time he had a chance to go to one of their house uh, study meetings. And the guy there, the, the elder was pretty sharp and he found out, you know, who, what Walt was from, you know, Christian-wise. So he really tried to play up on the fact that, you know, we believe in baptism for mission of sins. And the so they rigged it, bro. And, yeah, and, and Walt, you know, he didn't know a lot about that. And he didn't realize all these other things in the hopper. And he started saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe they're kind of Christian in this sort of kind of way. Well, see, they are because they've become successful. And in America, you see, you just can't be negative toward the own reader's digest. Except you know, that you know, Marriott. Marriott uh, Mary, Mary hotels and motel. Donnie Murray. So, so how, how can you be? God wouldn't make you successful if God wasn't at work in your life. See, well, you can't, that's an American myth, see, but... No, no, well, these are large. See, this is a billion. See, when we can't address everything, we try to get categories that can empower us to move on whole perimeters of the world. No. Uh, there are more, these are total worldviews, but I'm going to put Hinduism and Buddhism. See, both of these viewpoints, see, both of these, have, and there's, the problem is that some people are both, but that's only a technical demographic problem. 750,000, 500,000, so there's over a billion, billion and a quarter that are Hindu and Buddhist. And, and they may be both of those things, and that doesn't count 
uh, Shinto and Tao and, and species of it. But see, they don't have any view of creation. And it is ultimately an idealism. See, matter isn't real. It's Gnostic, like in the first century. We've got to get out of the body. See, we've got to escape. And religion is not just to control the body, but to get out of this world and get out of the material thing. Material things are illusory. That collapses physics and collapses all kinds of things. Medicine, and just think of all the practical ramifications of that viewpoint. And uh, so these are large chunks. We're talking about a billion. We're talking about, not quite, but I'm going to put just for early morning, three billion, two and a half, two point six, almost three billion people in the world, in Latin America, in the jungles, and in Africa, and in Asia, are animus. Thailand, and uh, uh, so we go around the countries of the world, should be marked. Where are the animus here? Uh, well, that's not large that bad, but sorry to know that. Where are the Bushmen in, in Australia? See, these are animus. We got animism, and the world's alive. See, and therefore the religious person is the person who has gained uh, magical access to controlling uh, these world spirits, the good and evil spirit. And that's like voodoo, witch doctors. Uh, see, it, there are differences, and there's different names, but the worldview is not different. They just call different things and they have different incantations, but we're still talking about creation. And you see, this is, this is, uh, I need to put two and a half because that would be more of the work. You see this, this chunk here? And uh, now, as though it's not all, the East, the East is the largest number of people, and the East has never been Christian, and the East has no worldview no worldview to deal with creation or science or technology the very thing that's shaping the 90s and the 21st century they have borrow techniques well they'll borrow and break but then that's foreign to the culture it's not merely foreign that they haven't seen it before it's foreign to their viewpoint huh? so it's different a child goes to school and learns things that they haven't known before but they will learn sooner or later. It's not foreign to their viewpoint. So new things aren't always foreign, but some things like this are totally foreign to the worldview. There's no place for that kind of thinking. No place for that. So you need to unpack that. Now, for our practical purposes, because it's just limited to uh, two or three hours, in the West, and I don't mean this is better or worse, it's just describing it. The West has been... I would put Aristotle. Aristotle's Decaido, his view of the heavens, that's concerning the heavens, and his physics. And Democritus was the head of the physics department at the University of Athens, and uh, 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 democracy and physics, he dominated the West up till, uh, up till the scientific revolution. Now, that meant that it was transmitted in schools and the scholars learned things and memorized things and gave the correct orthodox answers and yet there was no revolution with that information. So you, you can transmit information and you can get A in the information that is powerless to deal with the world. Okay? Now, Aristotle, as a matter of fact, and then between Galileo and Newton, now, when we say between Galileo and, and Newton, it was the freely falling body and gravity, freely falling, the free fall. These two concepts, he opens up ballistics <laughs> and missiles and all kinds of shooting an arrow. You know, how, how do you get a projectile to hit?